Hi, everyone. Welcome. A lot of you in the chat here to the European Volleyball Show. Got in a very exciting one here for you guys today because I know, I know all of you in the chat. We can see the chat going. I know a lot of you are here for one reason, and that's the biggest match of Eurovolley so far. Turkey versus Serbia happening in two hours. It's going to be a great match. And as always, of course, I'm joined by Rob St. Clair. Rob, how are you doing on this Friday? I'm good, Dan. The better question is how you are doing because you are <laughs> coming at us live right now from Ostrava, the Czech Republic. Like um, we had to move you out of earshot of the court because <laughs> there's a match going on right now. Uh, Italy playing Belarus on the men's side where you are right now, which is just so cool. So um, yeah, a lot of volleyball to get to, but you're really right in the middle of it, which is pretty yeah. cool. So I'm here, if you guys don't know, from the Czech Republic doing all the uh, interviews, everything, helping out with the content. Um, of course, the show as well. I hoped to show the game for you guys in the background, similar to how we had in the Super Finals, if any uh, dedicated fans remember that. Um, unfortunately not. I'm in this uh, this room here, but uh, hopefully it'll still be a good show. Uh, Rob, where do you want to start here? Well, it, it worked out really well, the timing, Dan, that we had to move the show up a couple hours from the time when we usually do it because, of course, we've got some very big volleyball to talk about coming up in just a couple hours. Uh, I think let's let's jump right into the first women's semifinal, Dan, Turkey versus Serbia. I know the match that a lot of people came here to see and came here to hear us talk about. Yeah, for sure. Turkey versus Serbia, obviously a rematch of the 2019 finals where Serbia won their second Eurovolley in a row, three to two. That was, I mean, everyone, I think everyone watching the chat still remembers how good of a match that was. And I think we're poised for an as good, if not better match today. It's going to be a great one. Um, by the way, everyone in the chat, love that everyone's being so involved with the messages. Um, as always, if you guys have a question, ask it to us. Unfortunately, neither of us uh, can read Turkish. So if you guys want us to answer a question, uh, that'll have to be in English. Um, and also like the stream, guys, if you are enjoying it. And uh, let's like, make this our highest viewed stream ever. I think it has a good shot. Last but not least, if you're looking for the, the stream of the match itself, first of all, it doesn't start for another two hours. Uh, but second of all, there's a link pinned in the chat for how to watch it on Eurovolley.tv. It'll be on that platform, not here on YouTube, um, but an incredibly cheap subscription price to be able to watch all the matches for Eurovolley. So go check that out if you're looking for the actual match itself. Yeah, for Stick sure. Stick around to hear us talk about it because <laughs> we've got two hours to preview the semifinal. We've got nothing else to do but uh, talk about the incredible match we're about to see. Yeah, we're sorry, guys, that we can't uh, show the match for you here. But uh, I think uh, I think if you want to watch it, it's very accessible. And uh, we're going to do our best totally. to break down all the storylines going in. Um, maybe since she's on my screen right here, Rob, uh, we have Ibra Karakurt, which we talked about on the last show. But she's continued her dominance as one of the best scorers. Um, of Eurovolley so far um, in the absence of Miriam Boz. Do you think that's going to continue um, in the semifinals or, or, or what do you think the storyline is that's, going to be there? Well, that's the interesting thing is because now Miriam Boz is yes. back. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that, that's, that's so interesting because now you have almost a problem. I, I don't, I, it's weird to call it a problem to have two superstar opposites. Uh, but we talked about it with Turkey in the Olympics, and we talked about it with a few other teams, like the Polish men's outside hitters, for example. Like when you have a lot, like multiple world class options, but only one spot on the court for them, it's actually very difficult to make the right choice and commit to that choice for your team. And if I'm Turkey right now, I would continue to play character because that's what got them to this point. Um, I think the Turkey's chemistry just from the eye test, just watching them these last couple rounds and their honestly dominance in the pool phase, which I think was most convincing of the teams that are here in the semifinals. Uh, I think you have to go with what got you there. And that was Ibar Karakert playing as well as she has. Uh, you don't, in, in the Olympics, Turkey had the same problem at the center position, but they don't have that issue this tournament. It's clearly Jansu Azbe's spot. Uh, but now with Mariam Bo's back, I, I don't, I think it creates a little bit of, indecision for coach Gadetti, but if i'm him i would i would continue to play character because that's what got what got turkey to this point i think they've been really good so far and i don't see any need to change that now yes for sure rob i mean at this point in the tournament it's risky to make such a big change like that but right. at the same time you might need to take risks against a team like serbia 
uh, that is just so dominant. Uh, Karakrit brings you a lot, especially on her best day, but maybe the uh, consistency isn't always there for her. Um, another thing you mentioned, the dominance of both teams in Turkey, is both teams are undefeated going into this match and really have not come that close to losing. Uh, both teams 7-0 and going into the semifinals. Uh, I mean, really, Rob, these might be the two best teams in the tournament. Italy has looked great as well, but maybe not top form Italy, missing a couple players. Um, this could easily be a finals, I mean, as we saw in 2019. But here we are, semifinals day, meeting up. Uh, <laughs> only one of these teams is going to be a guaranteed a spot of the finals. Well said. And yeah, I, I thought that Serbia hasn't been quite as impressive in their undefeatedness as right. Turkey has. Yeah. I think Serbia has been a little bit um, less than their complete top form, and uh, but clearly it hasn't mattered <clears> so far. Uh, the The thing that we've got to talk about though is Serbia is playing this match at home uh, they have home field advantage the rest of this tournament but regardless of which medal match they're going to be playing for um, on I believe Sunday are the medal matches uh, they will be playing at home no matter what and that was that an advantage that they did not have in 2019 when they won it and uh, I think just that little bit more of an advantage that might really help in a battle like this because you're right, Dan. This could have easily been the finals. Very easily could have been the finals. And I think whichever team wins this will probably be favored in the finals against either opponent. I, I would agree with that, Rob. I think the winner, yeah, I think the winner of Yorval is probably going to come from the winner of this match. Of course, you can't count out Iganu or, or even this new look uh, Netherlands squad potentially. Um, guys, so I, I see a lot of people asking, who do you think we have a better chance of winning? That is going to be the last thing we talk about here. We're going to uh, pick both sides, argue. Um, so I think that'll be uh, interesting, Rob. But let's uh, let's talk about key matchups, and even before that, let's talk about kind of how these teams got here. Specifically about the quarterfinals matches, um, Turkey beating Poland three nothing. Rob, that was I mean I we thought I think we both picked Turkey to win, but I think how convincing it was was a surprise. Convincing is exactly the right word. That was it was really really dominant by Turkey. That like Poland had actually a similar issue to what we were just talking about with the Turkish opposites between Stisiak and Smarzek that couldn't really decide throughout the tournament who was going to have that spot consistently uh, ended, up, ended up being Stisiak for the quarterfinal mm -hmm. but they were never able to find a way to score points on serve against Turkey Turkey's side out looked phenomenal um, and a good amount of service pressure as well coming from Karakurt. She was lighting it up, the, the speed gun on the jump serves, which was really fun to watch. Yeah, Poland, it looked like Poland never had a chance, although that last set was close. Um, the first two sets were not, and I think Turkey had so much momentum. They were just kind of a, a big, like a snowball rolling down a hill, so to speak, of just gaining momentum, and they weren't going to be stopped. I was very impressed by that. Yeah, and like you mentioned, that was a, <clears throat> sorry guys, um, like you mentioned, the reception line for Turkey has been a real strength for them all tournaments. I think with this, um, uh, Senalu is a great receiver, as we know, Simje Akos, incredible receiver, and Hande Ballad, and I think the three of them together are really, really going to be tough to crack. Serbia, Serbia's strong uh, serving team, especially Boscovic, uh, doing great so far, but I, uh, I don't know, I think... I think uh, that reception line could allow Turkey to run their in-system offense for pretty much the entire match, which is going to be tough to beat. Hande Baladin has had a really good tournament. Um, Turkey was looking for a little more security or consistency at outside hitter after the Olympics, and Baladin's really brought that so far. I was, I've been really impressed. For sure. Um, and not to take anyway, anything away from Serbia, because they also had a great match um, against... Um, Against, uh, sorry, I'm blanking here up. Uh, France, 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 yes, the three, three, one. three one versus France, three one versus France, who so, uh, we both yeah, talked I about as like a maybe that could have been a close match because France had been doing well. Yeah, and, and sure enough, France came out and took the first set. I was very impressed by that. I want to give France a huge shout out for their performance in this tournament. Like, whatever their sure. final, final standing ends up being between fifth and eighth, I, I would consider it tied for fifth. That's a huge overachievement for the French women, in my opinion. I didn't, I honestly didn't really pick them to make it out of pools. And so very impressed by them. And they came out and took the first set against Serbia. I'm like, oh my goodness, could we have the upset of the tournament right here? I thought we had already yeah. had the upset <laughs> of the tournament when when Sweden beat Bulgaria. That was the upset to, to that point. But um, Serbia responded and they turned it on. And I actually think that's a good thing for Serbia. Um, 
I was, we were saying that Turkey has been the most, like both undefeated Turkey and Serbia, but Turkey's been even more convincing so far. I would argue that Serbia having to respond to losing that first set to France actually helps. Uh, I think that's a good ah, thing to get a little, okay. uh, to get a little yeah. bit of that, that test and have, have the, the recent experience of being pushed back against a little bit. Um, because after they dropped that first set to France, they, were a completely different team 25 18 25 7 and 25 20 the remaining three sets that was uh, a beat down other than that first set like 25 to 7 in a like a championship quarterfinal is uh, is is a beat down no other way to say it so uh, serbia really turned it on after being pushed in that first set and i actually like that for their chances in this next one yeah, and like you said, uh, I mean, 25-7, not a score that you see that often at this level of volleyball. Um, France, a pretty tough serving team, though, and I actually, right. like, even even reception seems to be the theme here today, Rob, and I think Serbia did a, did a pretty good job uh, taking care of those taking care of those uh, pretty tough serves from uh, players like Alina Kazuta and, uh, and the rest of the French team, and, you know, Serbia is good enough when they're running out of system because, as we know, they just can just give it to Tiana Boscovic, who's going to score at 40% no matter what. But they're even more dangerous when they can get, uh, you know, Milena Rasic involved, uh, when they can get uh, the rest of their offense involved. And uh, we've seen those players start to score pretty well as well. Yeah, Milena Rasic was the second leading attacker for Serbia in the match. And that that goes along with the theme that we saw in the Olympics where the leading score was going to be Boscovic every single time, mm -hmm. but they don't rely on their outside hitters for all that much production. Like Busa had maybe, I think four or maybe five attacking kills. They, they just don't rely on the outside hitters to score points like that. They, they're servers, blockers, and especially receivers so that Onyanovic can work her magic when anywhere close to the three meter line and able to run the ball in the middle. Which is which she's so incredibly good at. So that's why a player like Rasic, will, a middle, will be the second leading scorer on the team. You don't see that all that often. Um, but then Boscovich, of course, we've got to give her the credit that she deserves. Uh, she's been great this tournament. She's been so reliable, so efficient at such a high volume, like we see from her on every tournament on every stage. This Turkish matchup, though, will be probably the best team that she, certainly the best team she's played against so far in this tournament. Yeah. But in, in particular, the middle blockers for Turkey are so much better than any other team mm -hmm. that Serbia has played so far. And given that Boscovic's favorite shot is that deep, uh. like slightly wrist away to position one, that's exactly the amount of space that the middle blocker is supposed to take up. And between Gunesh and uh, Ada Erdem for Turkey, that, that is a matchup that I like. We saw in the Olympics, the USA, when they beat Turkey pretty convincingly in the Olympic semifinals, their middles and their right back and middle back defenders did a really good job taking that deep position one shot away from Tiana Boscovic. And I think Turkey is built in such a way that they might be able to do a similar thing strategically. So I'm really curious to see how Gudetti kind of sets that block and defense up to not you can't because you can't stop Tiana Boscovich, but you can. It's been proven this summer that you can slow her down just a little bit, and that's everything if you can do that. For sure, and like you said, uh, I think Turkey has the back row defense and the the back row defenders yeah. to pull off that strategy as well. And if there's any coach that will find the smallest weakness in an opponent and ruthlessly exploit it and spend hundreds of hours studying it, it's uh, Giovanni Guidetti. He will find uh, find any advantage. Of course, we've seen. You can game plan all you want. Um, we saw the Super Finals Guidetti game planning against Iganu as, as much as he could. But at the end of the day, when, when you have a, one of these top tier opposites that's playing at this high level, unfortunately, like there, there's uh, there's certain things you can't game plan against. And, and Boscovic, we did see Team USA slow down, so for sure. And uh, the roster construction of Turkey is in a similar way. But uh, I, I'm still not entirely convinced, Rob. I think Boscovic can power her way through maybe a, a slightly smaller block than, or a slightly slower block maybe is the better word than Team USA. Yeah, I agree with that. It's just because you know what is coming does not mean that you can stop it. And that's the the like, the like thesis statement for her any time you play against Tiana Boscovic. She, she is just so consistent and hits a ball that you never see from any other hitter in the world. The contact point, the the 
pure power and how deep she hits it consistently. That's an incredibly difficult ball to defend because even though, like, even if she doesn't catch the fingertips of the block, which she's really good at doing, um, she can hit the court, like the back meter of the court, half meter of the court every single time over through around the block. Like, and I know she likes that uh, wrist away position one a lot, but she can slice it off pretty sharp. She can pull it cross body down the line. Like, just because you know that she's going to get a ton of balls does not mean you can stop her. But that's what I love about players of her caliber. Igonu is the same way. Isabel Hawk, same way. Like, you know that they're going to get probably 50 balls a game, maybe more. Um, but it's how you can defend against them that can prove your ability to hang around in those matchups. And uh, it kind of goes back to the debate that we had last week on the show, Dan. Serbia clearly dominated offensively by that one player. Turkey, although they have a player like Abra Karakert, are just much more balanced. They're going to go to the outside hitters a lot more. They will use the middle like on par with how much Serbia uses them, but it's not like if Abra Karakert doesn't hit 45% efficiency, they have no chance, which I believe to be the case for Serbia. So it's a really interesting battle of singular dominance versus a little bit more balance across the board. And we're going to see it at the highest level in just a couple hours. All right. So great points, Rob, before we get to the key matchup. So I'll start thinking about those, uh, for Turkey versus Serbia. I have, uh, we saw Mayan Yenovic get her 300th, uh, game the other day. So that was really great to see. Um, Rob, I have a question. Have you seen this, uh, Maya on Yenovic set where she takes kind of one, one hand over the ball, one hand under the ball, yeah. Do you know what I I'm talking about? That. It was, yeah, it was, I, I wish I could simulate what she did with, with my <laughs> yeah, hands right yeah, now. Yeah. It was remarkable. What What are your very, thoughts very on that? Cool. What are your thoughts? Is that a, is that a double touch? Is that a lift? Is this like a new mm. development and setting? Where, where do we stand on this one? <laughs> I actually think that that the, the photograph that was captured of her doing that was uh, just kind of highlighted a thing that setters have actually been doing for a long time. Just nobody really notices it because the options for a setter when the ball's passed really tight like that are almost always to just go up and grab it with one hand and uh, especially in the men's game but we've uh, onyanovich does this all the time she'll go up with one hand and she's able to gun it out to the outside like this or kind of flick it back with a couple yeah. fingers but it's most often that if you're going to go up like this you're just going to barely touch it to the middle and so when she set the ball like this the other day or whatever it, it was it was basically a two-handed version of the same thing i thought um, I didn't think there was any chance she could go anywhere but middle. Uh, but the fact that it came out so perfectly was what really blew my mind about that play. Uh, like, Onyanovich is not the tallest player. So she's had to make her career on getting good at getting up and grabbing those balls right off the net and able to distribute to more than just one option. I think that if she had done this and tried to go anywhere but middle, there's a chance it could have been a ball handling error, but well, I should never sell, uh, sell her short. She's so good. Well, I'll tell you one thing, Rob. She did the exact same thing to uh, position one, uh, deep ball set <laughs> the other day. Really? Yeah. I'll, Whoa. I'll, I'll send I'll send you, I'll, we'll share this later. But uh, yeah, my, I don't think I could think of anyone who can do a set like that. She's going to be a big part of this match, which brings us to our next one. Rob, what's your key matchup, Turkey versus Serbia? I think it's the middles. I think these two teams have the best four middle blockers combined in the world on the women's side, it, definitely in Europe. Um, and Italy has has the conversation for that. Uh, they're they're deep. Sarah Farr is out. They have a lot of high level experience. I don't think they have the size and just the pure raw power that all four of these middle blockers have for both Turkey and Serbia. And I already talked about how it's going to be really important for the Turkish middle blockers in the blocking phase to make the right moves to potentially slow down Tiana Boscovic. But, but I think that um, with the second offensive option for Serbia being middle, uh, I think it's going to be really interesting to see the chess match between those players, the balance first between re-blocking and commit blocking just the kind of spacing that both teams want to run on like the gap set in front versus the slide all the way behind and everything in between. I think that particular lateral movement between the middles um, offensively versus defensively is going to be huge because you, ha you have the elements of the, the superstar opposites and then the slightly more production out of the Turkish wings or the outside hitters rather the, 
the balance in the middle may decide who wins this match. I think that just might be the, the most crucial matchup that not a lot of people are talking about. All right, good answer. And I think similar to that, I think it may be an easy answer, but the setting battle is going to be a huge one as well. Uh, Maya versus Jansu, some really tough decisions on where to go. And I think both setters will, like you said, this is related to the middles. They'll need to know where to adjust on the fly in the match. You need to adapt really quickly. Uh, it's going to be a big coaching battle and setting setters being the extension of the coaches for the most part. There's going to be a lot of tactics, a lot of mind games going on. Uh, maybe you could see even like not going to Boscovich as much, establishing uh, the middles early, establishing your other outsides early. You could see Turkey um, really forcing the middle, like you said, and uh, you know forcing the uh, Serbian blockers to uh, to stay home so that their outside hitters have a bit more breathing room. It's going to be interesting. I think it'll evolve sets. I, I think there's no way this set is a over in three sets or this game is over in three sets. And Rob, do you want to do our final kind of uh, final argument? Who do you think is going to win Turkey versus Serbia happening in um, 90 minutes? 90 minutes. Uh, the last matchup I want to highlight that goes into my pick is the serve and pass battle. Uh, the most crucial and fundamental matchup in any volleyball match is if who can stay the most in system and who can serve the toughest uh, ace to error ratios, all those sorts of statistics, but it really comes down to who can pass the ball well enough to run their offense versus who can serve well enough to prevent the other team from running their offense. And I think that Turkey has a little bit of an advantage in both areas. I think that they are a slightly better reception team than Serbia. And I think they're a slightly better like, or more difficult serving team than Serbia. And I think Serbia has seen it all. I don't think that anything that Turkey can throw at them will be something they haven't seen before. But especially Turkey in reception, I think, has a little bit of an advantage. And uh, they have more out-of-system options than Serbia does. If Serbia is off the net, the ball's going to one place and one place only. Uh, Turkey has at least two out-of-system options, sometimes three, including the pipe. So I like that a little bit more for the balance aspect. And for that reason, plus all the other things we've said, I like Turkey in this matchup. I think that they will be able to pull this off against Serbia playing at home. I think that, that this will be a pretty monumental I would, I want to say upset if they can pull it off, but I've been really just so impressed by the Turkish balance and confidence and just really, it, it, it seems different based on the eye test versus the Olympics. It seemed like they played a little nervous and a little tight and maybe it was part of like the, the shorter leashes and more indecision about the starting lineup at the Olympics. And without some of those issues, I think Turkey has been playing really confident, having a lot of fun, really physical, and a little bit more balanced. And I like that in this particular matchup. Uh, I'm so excited to watch it, but I am going to make the, the YouTube fans happy and uh -huh. pick Turkey uh, three to two. I'll pick them in five. Three to two for Turkey. So let us know, guys, in the chat what you guys think, what you think the final score is going to be. Even even throw some set scores in if you guys are feeling our, like Nostradamus here. And remember, <laughs> like, like the video if, uh, if you guys are enjoying the stream so far. Uh, Rob, I'm going to disagree with you a little bit here. I think, um, obviously, there's Turkey's a very good team, but the best player on the court here today, I think we all know, is Tiana Boscovic, one of the best players in the world. The leading, scoring six points, seven three points per set on over 40% efficiency through the tournament. And she knows these Turkish blockers well. She knows these Turkish defenders well. She knows exactly where to hit the ball. You can game plan around her all you want, but Boscovic is going to get her 30 points on good efficiency. That is going to happen. There's very few instances, even when her team was losing last year in club, that she didn't score that well. And I think the rest of the team uh, is going to uh, do very well as well, supporting her in one key area, and that's blocking. I think Turkey is a great team, but I think the one thing maybe they struggle with sometimes is kind of a block blindness, hitting into the block a little bit more. Some of their wings are a little undersized. Serbia has a huge block, 15 blocks, 15 kill blocks against France. Rob. That was the difference in that game. And even if the rest of the team isn't supporting them in scoring, obviously Boscovic is going to be the leading score. Rasic probably two, uh, maybe Busa three, but um, at the end of the day, it's going to be Boscovic hitting, the rest of the team blocking, and I think that'll be enough for Serbia to repeat their Euro Volley 2019 finals and win 3-2. And of course, Maja Njenovic. <laughs> Almost went through without mentioning her, but she, she's a little bit of a factor as well. 
A little bit. Great point about Serbia's block. That's a huge strength of theirs. Serbia playing at home and some of the Serbian key pieces like Boscovic and Onjanovic play club in Turkey. So they know a lot of the players that they're about to play against really well. So some of those little intangible things are definitely going to be a part of the storyline. All right, Rob, I have a few minutes here before I have to leave. So let's go to our other side of the bracket. Go to um, the Netherlands versus Italy. That not we've talked this whole time about Turkey versus Serbia, but we have another great match on here tonight. Uh, Rob, who, where do you want to go here? Do you want to talk about matchups, some some key players? Let's uh, go over how they got there really quickly. So the Netherlands came out of that pocket of the bracket that included Serbia, or sorry, Sweden beating Bulgaria, uh, which was really surprising. And uh, the Netherlands had a really good match against Germany in the eighth finals. Uh, I think I think it was three two, if I remember correctly. Let me, uh, let me fact check. That. Yep. <laughs> yeah, but Netherlands. Uh, I mean, Italy's done, done the usual thing <laughs> that they that they're used three to. Three one. Yeah. Three one Netherlands over Germany, and then uh, a very convincing three zero over Sweden. That was a matchup I was really interested in, and the Netherlands completely took Sweden out of their comfort zone. So, and then Italy, conversely, without Katarina Bassetti. I think is playing their best volleyball of the year right now. I think they're playing better right now than they did uh, at any point during the Olympics, even yeah, with their full lineup. I've really, really impressed just on the eye test of Italy. Um, Miriam Silla and Elena Pietrini really holding it down on the outside, and they've been able to survive the injury to stare far with more depth out of the middle. Christina Kirikela has come in and been good. So uh, you also have Paola Egona, who we can't help but talk about. As much as I like the way the Netherlands have played and the way they've got here, I don't think they can possibly stop Egonu. I don't think they have the tools to score on serve in any way that can compete with Egonu's just raw scoring ability and athleticism. I, I like Italy in this matchup, and I'll give it to them um, 3-1. Um, yeah, for sure. And like you said, I think Italy, a lot of the players uh, started off a bit slowly through the tournaments. Uh, Sila, Petrini... Uh, Igano, I think they're all were being a bit casual at the beginning, and we saw that they they were still winning games pretty easily just because of their raw. They had talent. a pretty easy pool. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, but now that you know things are getting serious, we we uh, saw them come in in the quarterfinals and absolutely stomp a pretty good Russian team who we talked about on the last show. Uh, that took Serbia to five sets. That uh, you know took other uh, strong teams to five sets, uh, but absolutely no match for an experienced. Italian squad, even though it's Italy, they're really not that old. Egon is still like in her early 20s, which, is, uh, which but, is crazy to think about. But like like Boscovich, I think Iganu has another gear that she can turn it on uh, against this Netherlands team, Rob, who we didn't really talk about, but kind of a new look uh, for the Netherlands here. Uh, a lot of players kind of retiring uh, after the last kind of cycle. But we've seen uh, we've seen uh, Nika Dalderop for sure. She, I mean, she's always been... She, we always know she's going to be a big part of this Dutch team going forward, but she's really established herself as the premier player, in my opinion, for the Netherlands going forward. I agree. I've been, Dalderup's had a really good tournament, and I think so is just Plock. The, the two of them on the opposite sides of the court are able to score and produce. Yeah. They're both like, they're both pretty big. You don't think Plock's been as good? No, I think uh, you probably point to Anne Buys as the, as the secondary person, for me at least, uh, on the team. I think, I think Celeste Plock. I mean, I don't even know how much she's been uh, she's been a part. Like, she wasn't playing a lot uh, in that quarterfinals match versus Sweden, uh, just coming 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 in uh, spot minutes there. But uh, yeah, and with no Robin de Cruyff either, it's it is kind of a new look team. But uh, I thought Dalderup's been awesome. You know, Dalderup has been fantastic. Uh, Fifteen for thirty-one in the last match, a leading score. Uh, we'll That's see really though. I, I I I agree with you, Rob. I think uh, this is kind of the limit. I think this Netherlands team is going to be really good going forward. And I actually think getting to the semifinals is a big accomplishment for them in this tournament. But unfortunately, I think Italy is gonna gonna take it to them pretty well in the next match. Yeah, I think we're on the same page about that. You're not kidding about the beat down that Italy laid on Russia <laughs> in the quarters. By the way, uh, uh, no. we saw twenty five to eight in the second set. That is. Uh, like you said earlier about Serbia, France, that's not a score that you see like at all at this high level. Yeah, <laughs> I know. And uh, we've, been, but Italy, like we said, they they kind of just when they want to play well, that they go for it. And like you said, uh, missing Sarah Far hasn't really been too much of an issue for them. They haven't really seemed to skip a beat. If anything, like you said, they're they're just playing even better. Um, but I think it'll be interesting to me, Rob, for for this question though. Will they kind of go back to? 
the Aganu show in this in this next match? I'm afraid that they might because that's Italy's path to success in every tournament in the last three or four years has been exactly that. Like when you are in a key situation, a big match late in the tournament, then that's what they've been able to default to doing. And then Egon has been able to take them as far as she can take them. But I, I, I would like for them, especially against the team like the Netherlands, who isn't the best ball controlling team in the world. I think that they can afford to continue playing a lot more balanced when they get to the final, if they get to the final, sorry, against either Turkey or Serbia, they're going to need a go at her best. All right. But it- Sorry, Rob, to cut you off here, but we have to end this one a little early here. Uh, thank, thanks, everyone in the chat for watching. Sorry, Rob, but uh, we've got to go do some interviews. We have lots of matches here at Eurovolley. Thanks for everyone for tuning in and check out Turkey versus Serbia on Eurovolley TV later. Uh, we'll see you guys next time. We'll see you at the end. Thanks.